So it's 10.30, so 10. we will start. Yep. So everyone who attends, master students, bachelor students, um, colleagues from all over Europe and Central Asia, you are very welcome to join this course in sustainable development and sustainability science, which have been organized between the Swedish RLC Society and Karakalpak State University. Um, I want to tell you already now that this um, lectures will be filmed so they can be looked at afterwards if you want to repeat. And I will have a PowerPoint pictures, PowerPoint presentations, and they will all be available on the homepage of the course after this uh, session. So you don't need to take um, any notes if you don't wish. I will try to speak clearly and slowly because I know several of the students are not very proficient in English. So, but you are probably very much better than I am in Karakalpak language. I never tried even. <laughs> So with all respect for your uh, language um, um, efforts, please remember this is an international course. It is also a course in practicing your English language, which today is the international language that we all need to use and be able to use. Speaking, listening, reading and writing. Um, Okay, I will share screen now. <laughs> yeah, here we are. So we will start with the beginning of sustainable development. And then we will try to find out what actually it is. It started long time ago. The forest crisis in Europe was very um, urgent in beginning of 1700s, 300 years ago, even more. And uh, in Germany, the king of Saxony asked his forester to solve this crisis. This was Karlovitz, is the person to the right there. And he wrote a book on managing forests, thinking very much about, you know, planting trees, doing it in the proper way. And in Sweden, we also had such a crisis. And the response was to build a better um, furnace for keeping the heat in the homes uh, without using so much wood. It's the tile stove to the right. You see that the answer was how to deal with the resource crisis management skills, the handbook in forestry. It was published in 1713 and included for the first time in history, the concept of sustainable development 300 years ago. Or there were some technical solutions, for example, this stove. And there were the, there is also the possibility to use something else than wood, peat, for example. So these methods to deal with the resource crisis are still with us and they are important. Resource uh, management will be a main uh, question in this course. And deforestation, it is still a very important um, aspect of sustainability. A second route is the protection of nature. Very many people, especially in the 19th century, were concerned about nature was, you know, invaded by industries and so on. So they wanted to protect areas. The first such protected national parks was in the United States. In Sweden, the first one was in 1909 in the north of the country. This is the second aspect of sustainability. A third one is 
the concern that the population of people on the planet Earth were becoming, was getting too big. So perhaps it was not possible to um, provide for everyone. And this was first, uh, you know, formulated and written in this book by uh, Malthus, Thomas Malthus, 1798. So again, long time ago. And it was talked about by many people, I think in the Russian culture, it was especially Vernadsky who wrote about that. So we have three beginnings there, which is still with us. In modern development, it begins, begins in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, the first important contribution here was the American marine biologist, Rachel Carson, who wrote the book, Silent Spring, published in 1962. Uh, this was very well researched, showing how chemicals used indiscriminately all over uh, you know, the landscape were starting to kill birds in particular. So if you wanted to uh, uh, you know, use pesticides, it was not only what the intended use, there were also some other effects. For example, birds eating um, mice who ate the, you know, the, the corn that was uh, used for pesticides and so on in the food chains to make a very bad uh, impact on nature. This is still a concern, of course, uh, environmental protection. Another one was the very concrete effort by a research group in uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, in the uh, United States to actually find out what would the future of our planet be if we con continued the way we are. And they used a new method for calculation called system dynamics and a model of the whole planet called World 3 and try to find out what will be the effect. It, they had much statistics in here and uh, came out with the book Limits to Growth in 1972. Uh, and they uh, say there, we are searching for a model. I have to change this, you know, so. They're searching for a model output that represents a world system that is sustainable without sudden and uncontrollable collapse and capable of satisfying the basic material requirements of all its people. And they, they, uh, they, they said that there are limits to growth. You can't grow forever. And in fact, if you continue like they did in 1972, then we will come to an overshoot and a collapse. And the time for that overshoot and collapse was in, you know, long time in the future, around perhaps 2050 or so. But of course, it's not a precise time, it's a process. And here, more or less, at what they found out, if we will continue, overshoot and collapse. And we start to see this overshoot today. You know, we are using more resources from our planet than it can provide. And the, uh, uh, the effects of, for example, use of fossil fuels and so on are uh, showing up. Overfishing, we have overfished about 90% of the fish in the seas. Deforestation, we are cutting down enormous areas of forest and so on. This is where we are today. We are on the, in the area of overshoot. And of course, it's not sustainable. Um, I should say that the Limits to Growth book was uh, very widely published. The calculation was confirmed in uh, 1992, 2003 publication. So it was very much confirmed. And of course, nowadays, the economists who did not believe it first, they are now 
confirming that it's true. There are limits to growth. Also, 1972, uh, this, this um, photograph of the planet Earth from the moon was published. And it emphasized that we are a population on one planet. We have to take care of it together. This photograph was published more than any previous photograph at, at all. So it uh, you know, emphasized that we are one population on the planet. We have to work together to take care of it. So 72 was a very important year. The limits to growth, the photograph of the blue planet. And also in Stockholm, there was a first global conference on environment and development. Um, the, um, this led to the, um, uh, they started the uh, um, day of environment, June 5, uh, and it's, uh, you know, celebrated since. It was also a uh, effort to um, combine all the different um, countries in the world. So it, it's a very important meeting. It will soon be celebrated, it's, you know, 50 years later, next year. Um, so this is the beginning of sustainable development. Now let's go into some more theoretical. Is there a definition of sustainable development? Are there conditions needed to achieve sustainable development? Are there some empirical research on it? Or what can I do myself? So I would like to emphasize this. Sustainable development should mean a, a development which, which brings us closer to sustainability. Now, it's a simple way to phrase it. There are hundreds of ways to do it. So there is not a, you know, public definition or something, but this, I think it expresses very well what it all is. We should also emphasize that sustainable development <clears throat> is a system study. It's not only environment, or only economy or something. It includes many aspects. And we use the Aral Sea collapse as an example of this. So I think you are extremely aware of this picture of the Aral Sea and how it's shrinking. We see this diversion of the rivers to the Aral Sea impacting a whole system with nature, society, economy, and health and well-being. These uh, aspects are all connected. You see the population collapse. We have uh, respiratory illnesses. We have loss of fishery and economy. Uh, we have ecosystem collapse and so on. It's all connected. So it's a system question. I should also say sustainable development is a statement of justice. The ethical uh, aspects of sustainability are important. And of course, one very common way to phrase this is that sustainable development is a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So we have to be fair to our children and grandchildren. It's called intergenerational justice, justice between generations. But there, all, there is also the justice between us living now, the intra-generational justice. And there is also justice between us and all other forms of life, all other aspects of nature, which is now so dominated by humans that we talk about Anthropocene. Um, so there is a lack of justice in all these three respects. Certain conditions are needed for sustainable development. Um, the physical for 
conditions for sustainability was researched quite carefully by one of the technical universities in Sweden, Chalmers, and they formulated these four principles. You can't um, systematically accumulate substances in the ecosphere, in nature, if you wish, or society. Um, it, is very, it is both for those that are extracted from the planet, like fossil fuels, or human-made substances, like, for example, PCB or so. That was the first two principles. The third one is that uh, the conditions for production and diversity cannot be deteriorated systematically. And the fourth is that we need efficient and just use of resources, which is really not a physical principle, it's more an ethical principle. But anyhow, these four principles have been used to, uh, uh, you know, to manage companies, industries, to make them more sustainable. So it's quite useful. There are also biological conditions that needed to be fulfilled to achieve sustainability. And I think you all recognize them. They come from ecosystems. First of all, we have to recycle everything. We can't let them, you know, accumulate. This has to do with, um, you know, um, this, the recycling society. We need to have sunlight as the ultimate source of energy. So, for example, solar cells or wind turbines or something. Um, we can't use something unsustainable like fossil for that. Uh, we also need to um, uh, not have a too large population of consumers. In this case, it's ourselves, the people, can't be too big. And we have to maintain diversity. So these four principles are very useful for addressing what we need to do in our um, societies more than perhaps a single industry or a single city or so. There are in fact also social conditions for sustainability. That is, if we are healthy, we live a long life, which uh, it's more and more in our societies, the, the population will be aging. We have more and more old people and less uh, children. We have an aging society. We also need to share the resources we have equally. This is called intragenerational equity the, between us. It's an ethical principle, but it's also a condition for being able to have a sound society. The welfare we are creating cannot be based you know, on material consumption. It has to be based on non-material values. And that is also what actually is, um, according to all the uh, research we are doing on what people think is the most important in life, it is non-material values. Spending time with your friends and family and so on, not buying things all the time. And also we can't have an economy that's growing without limits. We have to uh, go from economic growth to a non-growth economy. And this, these things are not so well recognized, in fact, and uh, I put them together myself, uh, but I hope it points to something very important for sustainability. Sustainable development can also be studied as an empirical question. Uh, the most important book here, I think, is one from the American geographer, Jared Diamond. He published this book, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fall or Succeed, to Fail or Succeed. And he has many examples, uh, well, in fact, 14 examples of societies which actually collapsed. We see, for example, the Mayan society in mid-America, Central America is one. 
another example are the Viking society on Greenland. And uh, well, there are many more in fact. So he asked himself, why did these societies collapse? And the general uh, conclusion is the societies collapse because they did not preserve and manage properly their ecosystems. Forests were cut down and land animals and fisheries overused. So they did not take care of their ecosystems properly. Why did this happen? Well, he has five uh, reasons for this, different in different societies, societies which collapse. Technical development. We could, uh, for example, say the, the enormous capacity of fishing boats to catch fish is such an example. Um, and of course, also energy production based on coal and fossils is also such technical development. Economic pressures, people want to earn money and the uh, economic um, pressure was, you know, higher, stronger than the need to be sustainable. Denial mechanism, people denied, they did not think there was a crisis. There is a tragedy of the common. This means that there is a common resource and each one who can use the resource takes uh, much of it because if they did not, someone else would do it. So um, if there is a fishing, for example, if I don't catch this fish, someone, someone else will fish it. This means that it will be overused, the resource. So the answer to tragedy of the common is that we have to uh, manage the resources together. And then there are value questions, which I mentioned already, the ethics of sustainability. And why did they make disastrous decision which led to collapse of the society? Well, they perhaps he did, they did not understand. Uh, it was considered normal. That's the situation we are in today quite much. Um, there was a, a conflict of interest, especially between economic interests. There was the survival from day to day especially in developing countries, this is the case. If you want to survive to tomorrow, perhaps you have to take the only fish that's still there. And of course, the tragedy of the commons I mentioned. And then again, there are some very questions, especially some religious communities don't care about anything else, but what they think their God tells them to do. You know, these are possible futures. You see, one of these scenarios will be our future. Will it be pleasant or will it be no fun at all? Which one do we want of these futures? Well, we have the situation where we are uh, where we have uh, development against firm limits. You know, this, the planet is not any bigger than it is. And now I have to go back a little here. Yeah. So exponential growth against firm limits has just two possible outcomes. It's overshoot and collapse. That's what I already told you. It's foreseen in limits to growth, unless we change things. So this is one possibility. The other possibility is dynamic equilibrium. That is, we have uh, using the resources that we can use without destroying the resource. This is another word for sustainability. It means not too much, 
because then we will destroy our resource or our planet. Not too little, because then we won't have welfare in our society. So sustainability is in the beginning, in, in the middle. It's called lagom in Swedish, you know. It's, so it's, <laughs> uh, that's a very Swedish expression. It means not too much and not too little. So you see, this, this is the situation today. We have uh, the development we see here with fossil fuel use, destruction of ecosystems, pollution, the big poverty gap and so on. And it goes up here and then it goes down, less of all that. And there is another development that we wish here, the thick line where people are getting aware of the situation. They start to conserve resources in nature. They start to use renewables. They have innovation that solve problems and will come up to a situation which is called a equi dynamic equilibrium. We would like to have this crossing point from the unsustainable path to the sustainable path to come as early as possible, push this point uh, up. This blue area is the time of our lives. That, as, that is now. This is now we can change this. If we don't change things now, we will come to the collapse situation. So this is where we are now. Now we will have a break of 30 minutes. And during this break, the students who take the course, I'll ask you to discuss the course. What would you like to find out in this course? What is your interest? What is most important for you to learn? And then uh, now before the end of the 30 minutes, in 20 minutes, 20 minutes from now, we will connect again and uh, I will listen to what you say. Now we should continue. <laughs> and I will now go to share screen again. Yeah, here we are. I hope now you see the um, PowerPoint. Yes, sir. Yeah, you, you know, we left uh, the development of sustainability in 1972 with the Stockholm Conference, uh, the first global conference on environment. And in 1982, there was a wish to um, <clears throat> make another global conference, but it was impossible because of the situation in early 80s. It was very bad international uh, situation in terms of conflicts and so on, especially East-West conflict. So it was instead replaced but by um, starting a World Commission on Environment and Development. This commission was led by the Norwegian Prime Minister Brundtland, Harlem Brundtland, and they worked on this report for five years, and it became Our Common Future, published in 1987. And now, a little later, um, in the when it was Stockholm Plus 20 in 1992, of course, already in earlier, from 89 in fact, the international um, tensions were much, much less. The Soviet Union had been dissolved and uh, it was possible to think in terms of another conference. And this became the, the 1992 uh, Environment and Development Conference organized in Rio de Janeiro and Brazil by United Nations. It was called the Earth Summit. It was a huge conference. I think about 70,000 people took part. There were very many heads of state being present. So it was a very, very important conference. 
1992. And this conference uh, was, of course, prepared for a couple of years before, even more. And um, it produced a number of uh, um, documents which are very important. Um, first, I should say that sustainable development was very much established as a topic on the international agenda with this 92 conference. Um, not only environment, but sustainable development. Um, it produced uh, the Agenda 21, the Rio Declaration, and three Rio Conventions. We'll come back to those. And there was a new office on the UN headquarters in New York to handle all this. It was called Commission for Sustainable Development. So the basic document, or one basic document from the Rio meeting was then the Earth Summit Agenda 21. And here you see the, 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 uh, the picture of the book to the left and to the right you see uh, the people meeting is an enormous meeting with each country and there were 190 countries taking part. Each country had perhaps two delegates or something. So, you know, it immediately becomes something like 400 people <laughs> sitting together. Yeah, um, the, uh, the Agenda 21 is an agenda for how to accomplish sustainable development. It consists of 40 chapters, 40 chapters. Each of the chapters explains how to work in that area. For example, there is a chapter on education, there is one on energy, there is one on water, and so on and so on. So this was very important, the Agenda 21. And it was also formulated so it could be used locally by a city or nationally by a country. And in addition to the Agenda 21, there were three global conventions developed for the Rio meeting. The first one was a convention on climate change, the framework convention on climate change, UNFCCC. And uh, the idea was that countries in the world, the whole world should work together to limit climate change or uh, stop climate change. The next convention was on biological diversity, the CBD. And the idea with that is that countries in the world work together to reduce the reduction of biological diversity, which is very bad, at the still is in fact. And the third uh, convention was to combat desertification, of course, important in Central Asia. So um, this, um, the, the two first conventions were signed uh, after the Rio meeting, but the, the convention to combat desertification was not ready during the Rio meeting. It continued for a couple of years before it was agreed on in a meeting in Paris. I think it was perhaps 94. These three conventions are, you know, including practically all countries in the world, about 192 or so. And they all have yearly meetings, which are of course big meetings. It's called Conferences of the Parties. Now, this is the United Nations system. Um, and the United, United, United Nations system relies on consensus. Everyone should agree. You talk until it's possible to decide together. And of course, it's difficult because people and countries have different points of view. It's very seldom there is a strong uh, agreement on what each one should do, but they exist and they are called protocols. So the, some of these conventions also have protocols. And um, for example, the climate convention have the so-called Kyoto protocol, which tells you exactly what countries should do. Then uh, 
we need to talk about the agendas, the global agendas. What should the world do together to achieve sustainable development? And the first such agenda was the Agenda 21, with its 40 chapters. Uh, but of course, it was described, it described in each chapter what to do, but uh, not so much uh, precise when it comes to when it should happen, who should do what, and so on. Uh, so already at the meeting in the United Nations General Assembly in New York in the year 2000, there was a new agenda, the so-called Millennium Development Goals, MDGs. That was decided on in the United Nations. And these now there was a time frame. These goals should be met by 2015. And also there was some specificity when it comes to exactly what should be achieved. And the third agenda is the one we have today. It's called Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And it was introduced in 2015 as the new global 2030 agenda. Again, there was a time frame. It should be achieved by 2030. Let's look at the Millennium Development Goals. You know, there, were, there was a time frame to 2015. They were all quantified. And there was the goal should, uh, how much should be achieved during these 15 years. And I will not go into details. I'll just say that it, some of these goals were actually met. For example, goal two, universal primary education was quite good. Um, the um, um, the ec economic goals were quite also developed. So there is the economy worked quite well. Uh, there is still much to do in terms of poverty. There is much to do in terms of material health, excuse me, maternal health, health for mothers, um, and so on. So now we go into the sustainable development goals. That's the goals we have today. And they were established 2015 and they shall be reached by 2030. Here are the 17 goals. You might think that they are a little too much to keep track of, but in, it's not so difficult in fact. <clears throat> you see on the first line is very much social goals no poverty, no hunger, good health, good education, equality between men and women, and so on. Um, little later, you see social uh, society goals, if I say so, that societies should have clean water, sanitation, clean energy, decent work conditions, industry development, infrastructure, and sustainable cities and communities. And the very important goal is responsible consumption and production. And then there are goals that refer to nature. For example, life below water, life on land. So these are the ecosystems. Climate action, of course, it uh, refers to all of these things. And then peace, justice, and strong institutions is, of course, also for the societies. So you need to keep track of that. And you need to understand that all these goals are connected. And here it's very detailed uh, work being done. There are for each goal, some targets, what should be achieved. There are in total 169 targets. And these targets have indicators exactly what to measure. So it's a very large uh, machinery to keep track of all this. And countries need to report. And the European Union, for example, need to report on how they are uh, working with these targets. So this is what's going on at the moment. You know, if we achieve these goals, 
it's widely recognized that it involves in making a very big fundamental change in how we live on Earth, our planet. It's transformation, transition to a new situation. So this is the, you know, the six uh, line, if I say so, for sustainability, the global cooperation and the UN processes.